right, welcome everyone to this uh, joint webinar between uh, OPA and Lebanon Gas and Oil. This is just to let you know that you're in the right window. Um, we are in the webinar uh, on exploration risk price, the story of Zuhur with Dr. Ahmed Salah. So I will give a few more minutes uh, for the attendees uh, to join us and uh, we will start shortly. All right, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, this is Mark Ayoub. I, am, I had the, the privilege today to uh, moderate the session on behalf of Lebanon Gas and Oil team. Uh, our guest speaker for today's webinar in collaboration with OPA is Dr. Ahmed Salah, the general manager of Premier uh, Egypt. Uh, the topic we're discussing uh, this afternoon is uh, the exploration risk prize, the story of the Zohar field in Egypt. Uh, which Dr. Uh, Ahmed will be speaking more about uh, today and telling us more about its uh, technicalities, its details, and the story of it. Uh, how did they reach uh, from the, ex the exploration phase in 2015 until this, uh, the, the having the uh, today the field uh, producing around 2.7 billion cubic feet per, uh, per day. Uh, for those who don't know, the Lebanon Gas and Oil has been established since 2014 as the platform for all the updates, uh, news, and commentaries of uh, on, on the oil and gas sector in Lebanon and in the MENA region. So uh, we have been active since then uh, uh, on everything related to the nascent uh, oil and gas sector in Lebanon. And we are happy today to uh, collaborate with OPA in Egypt for uh, uh, for this webinar and for a series of webinars in the future concerning specific technical, geopolitical, and uh, also uh, uh, academic, if you want, um, uh, courses and webinars. Uh, and we have with us also from OPA, Dr. Karim uh, Magdi, who will be speaking now for around two minutes and introduce uh, OPA for the ones who uh, who don't know about it, and he will tell us more about the courses they are uh, being active in, uh, the, the several uh, courses and presentations they usually do, and uh, where uh, are they active, in which countries are they active. So, Dr. Magdi, the, please go ahead uh, before introducing Dr. Ahmed. Okay, thank you, Mark, for the words. Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, please, if you can't hear me well so far, uh, Please type one in the chat. Just okay. Awesome. So it seems like my voice is very clear. You know, there is no fluctuations in the network. So again, thank you, Mark, for your words and thank thank you, uh, LGO staff. Uh, I'm Karim Magdia, petroleum reservoir engineer and one of the co-founders of OPA Online Petroleum Academy. Um, I want to say thank you for everyone here, for all of you to show uh, interest in attending this fabulous session. And also, I'd have to show my appreciation for OPE teams in Egypt and Lebanon, especially in Jassam Henry from Egypt team and uh, in Jamar and in Jayat from uh, Lebanon team. Uh, actually, they are working around the clock to make sure that everything is well organized and well prepared for this session. And uh, regarding OPA, so uh, in brief, and uh, not take much time, uh, we in OPA believe in the Lebanese market, and that's why we are working close to you. Um, actually, uh, we are pretty sure, and we hope that in the near future, yeah, you will find your gas potential and gas uh, reserves. And we believe at that moment, uh, there will be, you know, uh, you know, a window of many opportunities for different jobs and different uh, fields, not only for engineers, but maybe for economists and uh, politicians as well. Um, at that time, I think uh, you will need our OPE service uh, regarding consultation, uh, technical studies, economy studies, and uh, training for sure. Uh, finally, uh, uh, I want to remind all of you that we have uh, four sessions uh, at least per month uh, for technical uh, awareness and non-technical for, you know, we're going to plan uh, sessions for uh, project management in the petroleum industry, for uh, petroleum economics, reserve calculations, and classification. So please will ask for any updates. And finally, uh, I want to say thank you again. Thank you, Mark, and thank you, LGO. And many special thanks for Dr. Ahmed to be among us in this session. Uh, okay, so go and have a nice session. Thank you. Thank you, Karim. Thank you, and thank you to OPA team in Beirut and in Egypt for uh, all the great work uh, you have been doing and for collaborating on this. So uh, before just introducing Dr. Ahmed, I just want to mention that the idea behind this webinar came after 
uh, or when we started speaking with OPA and Dr. Ahmed Salah concerning this webinar, um, we have been discussing the, maybe the technical, if you want, aspect of it and the similarities between, uh, possible similarities between the findings in the Egyptian Zohar field and the potential draining activities that were happening in Lebanon in our block four in Biblos one uh, well. Uh, so, uh, and then the announcement came by Total, or the consortium in our, our block four, by Total, Eni, and Novatech, that uh, unfortunately the first drilling well uh, uh, appeared to be dry. Uh, and that's why we, we were more enthusiastic to go and move forward with this um, webinar to understand more the geological, geophysical, and technical aspect of, uh, of, uh, the, of the Zohar field and what could be the similarities of uh, between this field and uh, the blocks, the, the Lebanese blocks offshore, offshore Lebanon. So without further ado, I'm just, I wanna welcome again, Dr. Ahmed to uh, this webinar. Dr. Ahmed is, uh, uh, has a BS in geology from Ayn Shams, Ayn Shams uh, University in Cairo. He holds also a master's in petrophysics from Ayn Shams as well. Uh, and a PhD in petrophysics. Uh, he has been working as the former vice president for agreements and explorations uh, in Egyptian natural gas holding company, EGAS, uh, and the responsible for promoting uh, the agreements and of exploration in the East Mediterranean uh, and Nile Delta area. Uh, he also uh, he has worked also as the exploration general manager in the Belaim Petroleum Company and Petroshuruk Company. Um, and at the Petroleum Research Institute for around three years as an assistant uh, lecturer. Uh, he also uh, works with the Egyptian Geophysical Survey of Egypt as field geologist, and this was early during his career in the 1980s. He has been awarded two times in the MOC in 2010 and in, 20, uh, in 2014. So we are glad to have you among us and uh, uh, we, we are delighted to know more and understand more about the Zohar field, which has been uh, discovered in 2015 and is known as the largest uh, oil field or gas field uh, in the East Mediterranean. Uh, it is now operated by the consortium of uh, ANI, which hold around 50% uh, um, of, of uh, its findings, plus other companies that will tell us more about the Russians, Mubadala, as well as BP, uh, which hold a smaller uh, activity. So by 2019, we know that uh, the field has been producing around 2.7 billion cubic feet per day. And uh, we are glad to know more about the story from 2015 to 2019 and how we reached uh, this level. So uh, the floor is yours, uh, Dr. Ahmed. And uh, for the Q&As, just one last point, please uh, do ask your questions in the chat box. Um, and I will be uh, taking those questions and asking them to Dr. Ahmed at the end of the session. So we'll leave around 10 to 15 minutes at the end of the session for Q&As uh, to answer your comments, concerns, or questions on this. So we will not be interrupting Dr. Ahmed during his presentation. Thank you, and Dr. Ahmed, please go ahead. Okay, thank you, Omar. Uh, Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. Assalamu alaikum, Ramadan Kareem. <clears throat> Well, before I start, uh, uh, Ahmed's presentation. Before I start, I'd like to add a comment about what Mark said about your first well in, uh, in Lebanon. <clears throat> Karim said it is a dry, a dry well. I have read the uh, press release of, the, of Lebanese uh, energy minister, and um, I understood it is a, a technical success. It's not commercial. The gas were there. It means in the oil and gas, the petroleum system is working. Uh, petroleum system is working. This is uh, the first step in exploration in a frontier basin like Lebanon basin. So this is, uh, this is a good and we'll see how the um, exploration is always connected to, uh, to risk. But yeah, I, it's, um, I don't like to say it's a dry well. It's, uh, it's not commercial well, they got it there, but it's not commercial wise. So uh, today, inshallah, I'm going to talk about the story of uh, Zohar, and the title is Exploration Risk Price. Exploration is always connected to uh, risk. In exploration,
In exploration, we are dealing with uh, rocks below the surface, starting from two, one kilometers, two kilometers up down to six kilometers. So we are dealing with these rocks below the, the surface through images, not through photos. We'll see, uh, this is a core photo, this is a, a photography for a exposed uh, geological section. And you can see nice bedding planes with different colors. And we can see uh, a fault plane. This fault plane is important in uh, having a structural trap in oil and gas. But if we go to reality, we'll see the seismic image. This is the seismic image we got. The first step in the exploration is to shoot seismic waves and it goes from the surface or from the seabed down to the earth and when it hits uh, building planes, it comes back to the surface. And then uh, the time, the traveling time from the surface down to the uh, building planes and getting back is calculated and the depth is uh, estimated. But if you look at this seismic section, you can find here some reflectors. We call it in seismic, this is reflector. And it means it's a sort of building planes with different seismic velocity. But if you look at this section, it's a hazy, you can see nothing. If you go up again, it is a hazy one. To the left, you have some good bedding. You have here good bedding as well. To the right, it's a hazy. So to judge if this is a, a bedding planes, or this is a massive rocks, you have to have a model, you have to have a good experience, and you have to work on the surface a lot until you have a good geological model and then go to subsurface and then make your interpretation. And finally, it's a sort of interpretation. No one can judge this will have, uh, this is a trap rock or this is a seal rock, and we can produce oil and gas. And we, you can see and we'll see for Zoh, the concessions that uh, the area where Zohar was discovered, it was run by Shell. Shell is one of the biggest uh, oil companies worldwide. And it was run by Shell for seven years. And they have recognized the structure of Shell, of uh, Zohar. But, and there is a published paper about this, and they said finally, it's highly risky, and they refused to drill it. And this is a very big company, and then came any and the drill and make that uh, discovery, we know all about it. So uh, exploration is always connected to the risk, and in any exploration well, especially in, in wild areas, the possibility of success do not exceed or all the time between 15% and 20%, not more than that. So the possibility of failure is much higher than the possibility of a success, but this is the exploration. Uh, if we read this statement, several times in the past, we have thought that we were running out of oil, whereas actually we were only running out of ideas. This statement was written in 1958, so 60 years ago. And the lesson or the, what we can get from it is the ideas. Where, 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 whatever it is a frontier basin or even it is mature basin, having a good ideas, a new ideas, it's very important uh, for exploration. And Although if exploration is directly connected to the uh, risk, but again, it is directly connected to the future. When you make a discovery and then you start producing from this discovery, with time you will consume most, most of the oil or gas reserves. Finally, if exploration do not add additional reserves, you will end up with a consuming all the gas. So, Again, exploration as it is connected to risk, but again, it is connected to the future and exploration all the time, shaping the future of the companies and of uh, the nations. So uh, the agenda of today, and before proceeding, I'll, I'll let you know, Zor honestly is a gift from Allah for Egypt in this time. 
because at that time in Egypt, we have been suffering from a shortage in, uh, in gas production, and we have uh, suffered a lot from uh, shortage in power all over Egypt. And then Zohar came in the right time and to overcome this gap. And currently, alhamdulillah, we are exceeding uh, our uh, domestic needs uh, from gas. So the agenda for today, first we'll cover uh, the East Mediterranean. We'll talk about sedimentary basins, hydrocarbon potential and gas fields, and then move to Egypt and cover the, uh, the gas discoveries, and then finally Zohr uh, gas discovery, and we'll talk about uh, the story of Zohr in more uh, details. This map was released by the U US Geological Survey in 2000, and it delineates the uh, sedimentary basins. And this red lines, it delineates the sedimentary basin. And here we are talking about geological boundaries. We are not talking about political or administrative boundaries between uh, countries. So this is a geological boundaries. And let's start with the uh, Nile Delta Basin, which is, uh, uh, onshore Nile Delta and offshore Nile Delta, and it is a well-proved uh, gas province, and there is a lot of gas discoveries onshore and offshore, and we'll talk about this in details. To the west, this, uh, this is Herodotus Basin, and this is a frontier basin with, without any exploration drilling at all so far. Uh, but I think yeah, uh, maybe in the near future in Egypt, they will start drilling in the Egyptian economic water. Uh, to the east, there is a Levantine basin, and then Lebanon basin to the north. And in some literature, and we'll see another map for the basins that uh, combine Lebanon basin and Levantine basin in one basin. What we mean by sedimentary basins, this is a huge sedimentary uh, thick, it exceeds 10 kilometers. And within these sedimentary rocks, we get some elements of the uh, uh, petroleum system, source rock, reservoir rock, trap rock, and so on. So the first step in exploration is to look for a sedimentary basin. And in Lebanon, there is a, a sedimentary basin offshore uh, Lebanon uh, territory. Uh, uh, East Mediterranean hydrocarbon potential. This again was generated by the US Geological Survey, and it estimated the, reserve, the, the expected uh, re, uh, resources in Nile Delta Basin for oil, 1.76 uh, billion barrel of oil, and for natural gas, 223 TCF. Currently, the booked reserves in Egypt is about 70 uh, TCF, so still there is a lot of uh, resources to be discovered in the Nile Delta Basin. Moving to the Levantine Basin, and here Levantine Basin combined the Levantine Basin and Lebanon Basin in one basin, and the estimated uh, oil resources is 1.68 billion barrel, and natural gas 122 TCF. What is discovered in Israel currently is about 30 TCF, so still a lot uh, is remaining for discovery uh, efforts. East Mediterranean uh, gas fields. We'll talk about the, the, there are three or four main gas fields that was discovered in East Mediterranean away from the Egyptian discoveries. In Cyprus, it's Aphrodite. Aphrodite is uh, 4.5 TCF. And this is estimated resources. Uh, the uh, structure is not clear, and I think one or only two wells were drilled. So they call it estimated resources. It means it could be higher, it could be uh, lower. And recently, Calypso was discovered to the west of Aphrodite with ATCF uh, gas in place estimated as, uh, as well. Uh, in Israel, there is uh, Tamar, field, which is nearly uh, 10 TCF, and this is in production currently, and uh, there is uh, Dalit, I think, and then uh, Levatan. Uh, Levatan is uh, not 
well proved uh, in the British Petroleum Statistics that is published every year. It is not recognized in their statistics because it's not totally uh, proved. It needs more drilling uh, to be uh, uh, included in the uh, petroli British Petroleum Statistics because they have uh, some criteria to be added their uh, statistics. Tamar is the only one that is uh, there. So if, if you check BB statistics, you will find Israeli reserves is only around 12 or 13 TCF and uh, Libatan is uh, excluded. Uh, this is again the uh, Libatan, Tamar and, and the Dalit Aphrodite and this is uh, Zohr. We'll talk about Zohr in details later. And this is Aphrodite, the field discovery. This is sandstone. Uh, Miocene clay, uh, this is the structural uh, contour map. It, it shows this is the trap, and this is the uh, limits of the trap. And the reserves is about 4.3 TCF. And you find it is variable. Here it is 4.3. In the previous slide, it was 5.4. So it, it, it's not uh, a proven reserves. The other one is uh, Tamar field. Reserves is 10 TCF, and Tamar is in production. And most of the uh, natural gas that is consumed in, in Israel for electricity generation is uh, derived from uh, Tamar uh, field. Uh, let's move to uh, Egypt. We'll talk about the gas discoveries. Uh, gas discoveries in Egypt, you, you can find a lot of gas discoveries. And, but finally, it is uh, can classified into three main provinces. The first province and the oldest one is the uh, Nile uh, Abu Mahdi Bellew Valley that extends from onshore to out uh, to offshore and it extends for more than 120 kilometers with different uh, gas fields scattered along this uh, trend. To the west, there is a lot of uh, Miocene and the Pliocene gas discoveries, mostly gas discoveries. And, and to the right, there is, uh, this is, we call it uh, Rosetta trend. And to the right, there is Temsah trend. This is a structural trend uh, that uh, hosted a lot of uh, gas discovery. And it is ranged from Pliocene down to Miocene. Some are dry gas, some are wet gas. And by, mean, by wet gas, we mean there is a lot of uh, condensate and this is very light oil that comes out with, uh, with the gas. And to the far north, there is a Zoh, uh, the gas discovery. We'll talk about it in, in, in more details. And currently, and la, uh, we are working on the area north of Sinai. And there is a, a two uh, oil well discoveries, oil discoveries, but not commercial. And there was Noor. Noor was in, in, in the geological, uh, in geological concept, it was very similar to Zoh, and that's why Eni came and uh, decided to drill it. But it was not uh, successful as well. It was not commercial. But in, in Noor, the, sim the similar <coughs> structure was failed. But we, uh, we had the Oligocene above that uh, carbonate uh, primary uh, target. And this Oligocene is widely uh, covered the area of North Sinai and it has a very rich gas in all the time. So although this is another exploratory well, the main target was not successful, but we hit another good target. It was not a very big commercial discovery, but it is. Uh, it can be commercial in the future, but it opened the hopes of adding additional targets to the exploratory ones in the area north of Sinai. Generally, in north, in the area north of Sinai and in the Mediterranean, the main target is the Pliocene and Miocene, and then the Oligocene is added. Oligocene is added in the uh, Temsah. Uh, trend as well. So uh, let's move to the last item in the agenda. And 
talk about Zohar gas uh, discovery. Uh, uh, gas and field discoveries in the Mediterranean onshore, the success ratio of the exploratory ones is 45% onshore Nile Delta and 69% offshore uh, Mediterranean uh, Sea. The majority of discoveries are multi-TCF and giant one uh, Zohr uh, field. Zohr field. First, it is outstanding biogenic gas accumulation, about 30 TCF of original uh, gas in place in a carbonate platform. Uh, gas area is expected to cover about 100 uh, kilometer, square kilometer. Uh, World-class carbonate reservoir with excellent petrophysic, uh, petrophysical parameters, uh, about 624 uh, meter of continuous hydrocarbon bay hydraulically uh, connected. It means it is one uh, reservoir. Innovative play, not recognized in previous exploration campaign in Egypt, uh, deep water and ultra deep water. Actually, this is the um, uh, first gas discovery in carbonate reservoirs in the, uh, in the uh, East uh, Mediterranean. Most of the Egyptian gas discoveries and Israeli and uh, Cyprus as well is uh, sandstone uh, gas reservoirs, not carbonate. So this is the first uh, carbonate uh, reservoir, uh, that giant one in uh, East Mediterranean. The map shows the Zohra location, and it is about 220 kilometers away from the Egyptian coast, uh, north of Bursaid city. The gas in place is nearly TCF, water depths 1,500 meters, deep water technologies and the drilling installation equipment required. The gas field area is about 100 kilometer, square kilometer, distance from shore 220 kilometer, world longest direct tie back to the shore, among the longest control system worldwide, and we see the umbilical that connected the platform to the uh, wells is more than 160 kilometer, and this is the longest control system worldwide. This is the uh, structure of uh, Zohar gas field, and this is what's called the uh, structural high, and this is the carbonate platform that was developed above that structural high. And um, the question of similarity was came uh, to me from the um, from Obi A and from Mark in the beginning about the similarity of Zah. Uh, actually, if you if you'd like to look for the similarity from geological point of view, I don't think there is a lot of similarity of Zah, uh, but it has to be. This is a trend in. in and it has to be followed. And we have recognized in the Egyptian water uh, two other, uh, two or three uh, Zohar similar type. I mean by type, it, it, structural type to have that high and where a, a potential of carbonates that are deposited over that high in the past and then came the uh, salt or other uh, rocks that make a ceiling. The yellow line represents the top of the carbonate and this is the salt, and base of, this is the base of the salt to the left and to the right. And between the base of the salt, the, all this area accommodates uh, the gas in, uh, in salt. This is the location of Zohar 1. It was uh, drilled in the highest point of the, of the structure. So uh, the Zohar field in milestones in January 2014, the production sharing agreement was signed between EGAS and ENI, the Italian company, uh, to explore uh, gas or and crude oil in Shuruk, uh, offshore concession. And Egypt, in Egypt, we are working with the production sharing uh, agreement. And this is a scheme from different other schemes that are working worldwide. In August 2015, announcement of the commercial gas discovery in Chiruk uh, concession. Uh, from September 2015 to February 2016, 
the main documents were signed to start the uh, development of the ZOHR, and it includes the development plan that is uh, prepared by ENI and approved by EGAS, and then the development contract, the contract and, uh, between ENI and EGAS, because in the production sharing, the ENI has to support all the investment the, for the, the discovery development. And then gas sales agreement, this is a, a agreement between the EGAS and ENI for EGAS to, to, uh, to buy all the produced gas because it is needed inside the company. And then establish the JV, joint venture company that will operate the operation uh, of uh, the development and the operation of the on behalf of ENI and EGAS. And then start of production by end of 2017. Uh, production started after ENI invested about 5 billion uh, US dollars has been spent out of total investment that was estimated at 12 billion required for full uh, field uh, development. This is the uh, Zohr uh, reservoir. This is the map. It shows the um, uh, how uh, the length of the structure is nearly 18 kilometer, uh, more than 600 meter of continuous gas, uh, gas bay, carbonate reservoir characterized by good to excellent petrophysical parameters. Overall, porosity average is about 16 uh, porosity uh, unit. And the porosity, by the way, is the storage capacity. Uh, this is the void or the spaces within the rocks where the gas is accumulated within the porosity. So estimating the porosity will reflect the estimation of the gas reserves. This is again the project the, to the left. This is the map of the field. And this is the uh, production pipelines that extends from the wells in Zohar area to the shoreline uh, west of Borsaid city. And it extends for more than uh, 200 uh, kilometer. And this is the control platform that has the umbilical that connected the platform and the control room with the subsea facilities. And from the control platform, the operator can control the uh, wells they can inject the fluid, they can control the production rate, uh, they can close uh, the well when it is uh, needed. And this umbilical is extended for more than 160 kilometers and it is the longest world uh, wide. Zohar uh, field achievements. Zohar is considered one of the largest gas fields in the Mediterranean with unprecedented achievements record. In exploration drilling was earlier than what is planned by uh, two years, achieving huge gas in place volume, about 30 TCF, and uh, more than 19.5 million barrel of condensate. The, the good achievement is start of production in a record time. 22 months from establishing the JV and the start the development process until we get the first gas from Zoh. In similar projects, it requires a period of time not less than five, uh, five years. Zohar achieves, why? why? Why we get this achievement? We get this achievement because of many uh, reasons. First, the presence of big domestic market and in Egypt at that time, we were uh, badly need the gas. So the market is there. In, in Africa, in, in, in East Africa, there is a lot of gas discoveries, multi TCF, but without, because of it is away from the market, there is no market in East Africa. So it is waited, it is waiting for a long time until it has a facilities to export uh, the gas to the gas uh, markets. And then we have a gas processing facilities are available along 
the Mediterranean coast. We have a lot of gas facilities starting from northern Sinai to west to uh, Marsamatru. More than 300 kilometers with a lot of gas facilities. And then the availability of world-class service providers. All the major service providers worldwide are working in Egypt and has established uh, workshops and a big staff. And this facilitate the, the, the um, drilling, logging acquisition, testing, and then later uh, production. As well as the presence of skilled and well-trained local staff with wide experience in IOCs and NOCs as well. And this has helped the uh, IOCs to reduce their cost in drilling and in uh, developing. And then the, one of the major issues why we had this achievement in this time, local petroleum industry service providers. There are three very big uh, Egyptian companies, Petrojet, MB, and BMS. Petrojet is a construction contractor, MB is engineering contractor, and BMS is a, um, a contractor that are working offshore for uh, production lines uh, laid down. Without having these three uh, big companies, we cannot achieve uh, this first gas after 22 months. And then finally, and we have to recognize the role of ENI in this. ENI covered all the required investment to develop the field in the due uh, time. And of course, without investment, without money, you cannot, uh, you cannot uh, do uh, any achievement. And finally, uh, natural gas is a, currently is a preferable source of energy in the near future. But they start to talk about gas as a transitional, transitional energy, not the far future energy. They starting from now, it is a transitional energy and the future will be for the renewable uh, energy. Thank you. Thank you Thank for you. listening. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Dr. Salah, for the valuable information and insight about this uh, great well and for sticking to the presentation time. Uh, actually, we have a lot of questions uh, concerning the slides, which I will try to uh, tackle as much as the time allows. But uh, first, uh, if you want, let's start just from the, uh, just a point on the geo geological or geophysical, let's say, aspect of it. So you have mentioned that uh, uh, the Oligocene uh, came after the, the, like the first funding were Miocene and Pliocene, and then the Oligocene uh, came afterwards. Uh, one of the questions that, that uh, did you find any, uh, of course, there are no similarities, as, as you mentioned, between this and the Levantine, but uh, did, did you, uh, by any chance, find any similarities uh, in those geological eras with, the, for example, the wells that have been, that are currently producing in Cyprus, which is nearest to the, like, to the Zohar field or to the geology of uh, Cyprus? Uh, like, uh, how do you assess, if you want, the geology of uh, the fields that are producing in Cyprus and they are uh, currently now discovered with the one that in the Shuruk field and in the previous ones of BP? Uh, okay, as far as I know, Yanni, I'm, let me correct you, you might be Israeli production. I, I, don't, I don't think uh, there is a product, gas production in Cyprus for the time being. The production is in Tamar field in Israel. And in Israel, this is a Miocene, this is a plastics reservoir, uh, not, uh, not a carbonate uh, reservoir. Yes, not carbonate, but I mean, in, in terms of the geology, like uh, uh, which are the ones that you have already mentioned uh, in, in this geological era. So I'm not, uh, we're tackling maybe the, the surveys that have been done there. Uh, I have like one other question on that, uh, which might be, for example, uh, you have mentioned also about the shell, uh, which has decided to, to like uh, be 
prior to uh, to having any there. So what was the reason, in your opinion, that Shell decided not to drill in the Zohar field and then he came decided to drill there? This is a question from Mustafa Tariq. Okay, um, the point of from the first, I said exploration is linked to risk. And the uh, possibility of success of any exploratory well does not exceed 20%. So it means 80% failure. So, so it depends, this is the schools. We are talking about two big companies. This is Shell and this is Eni. Shell decided not to uh, drill it because it was a risk, but Eni decided to drill it. And I'll mention something else in, 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 uh, in the mock. In the mock in 1912, uh, uh, I think, the exploration manager of Eni in Egypt demonstrated the uh, prospect of Zohar. And they were looking for a partner to invest in a drilling exploratory well in this structure. Again, the, it was British Petroleum. They refused to join them and sharing the risk in drilling Zohar 1. And they said, and this is the exploration, any exploration manager in Egypt. They said, no, this is not carbonate. This is the basement. Basement means it's, it's, it's a high block but it, it hasn't any potential. So we have Shell refused for the reason. British Petroleum refused, but they uh, justified. And no, they believe this is uh, a basement, not a carbonate. And then Eni decided to take the risk and the drug. All right. So, so it's, it's a purely a risk assessment perspective from the point of view of international oil companies, in your opinion? Yes, yes, definitely yes. Uh, another question from Johnny West to ask you how much of that infrastructure had to be built especially for Zohar and how much was already there uh, be, be because of other offshore fields. In other words, like uh, did, did you install or for the Zohar field, did the companies install everything uh, from the beginning or they had to move other infrastructure from other operating field to the Zohar, uh, Zohar area and the Shuruk field? Yes, yes, no. Actually, uh, Zohar uh, has uh, a very small percentage of H2S. So all the infrastructure uh, were built uh, starting from the uh, uh, wellheads to the surface facilities. If, if Zohar was a clean gas without H2S, I think these 22 months could be reduced uh, to less than uh, 12 months. But we have to build everything, the production pipelines, the platforms, and the surface facilities as well. Mm -hmm. All right. Um, another question from Rahim Youssef. What is in your uh, explanation that most of the drill, uh, drill dwells uh, are produced uh, in, in the fields located uh, in the occupied lands or in those on Egypt or in Lebanon, for example. So maybe this is a purely geo geo yeah, like geopolitical, like I'm not sure if you would like to answer it, but I'm, I'm, I, I will state it as is. So um, uh, Brahim asks that most of the fields that are in uh, occupied Palestine or in Lebanon are not producing well. Uh, or as you have said, as you has mentioned, it's uneconomic, but uh, all these fields are ge geologically affiliated to the basin or to the, uh, to the basin in Egypt, Cyprus, uh, Israel, or, uh, or others. So uh, do you think that, uh, I am trying just to explain maybe what Brahim has meant. So do you think in, in those decisions uh, or the decision making in, in those companies, is affected by some geopolitical, if you want, decisions or uh, influenced by geo geopolitical, not, not purely technical data? No, 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 no not at all. Uh, first, for the, there is some Pliocene discoveries in front of Gaza. It was made by BG years ago. But for the political, think, yeah. for the political uh, position now, it cannot be developed. This is one. For Lebanon, as far as I know, this is the first drill dwell. And for for the for the companies, for for, for the international companies, they spent uh, let's say uh, I don't know the cost of this well for uh, 50, 60, 70 million dollars, and then uh, they hide the results for some political reasons. 
they are look, who will pay for them? Yani they are looking for profits. So they spend a lot of money uh, to, to, to get some profits. So if they would like, or they ask to hide the results, okay, it means they should be paid. Who will pay billions for such companies to hide the results? I, I don't believe in, in, in this yeah. actually. Yeah. And I, I'm, I'm sorry, I, I heard a lot of this about this, yani, uh, this concept even in Egypt years ago, but I don't believe in it at all. Right. Um, Elia, Elia Abdouf also asked you, what kind of draining problems were encountered in Zohal field and what draining technologies were implemented to solve those problems? So uh, purely maybe technical uh, related to the drilling uh, technologies that were used, any problems, draining problems there in Zohar during those 22 month period? Uh, well, I'm, I'm, I'm not well familiar with the, uh, the drilling uh, actually, but I'd like to, to, uh, to emphasize that although um, uh, Zohar is in a water depth more than 1500 meters, uh, but uh, it was not complicated in drilling issue uh, because once we finish the salt, we hit the top of the carbon. Yes. Mm -hmm. Most of the problems came from uh, sometimes the losses, complete losses uh, of the drilling fluid within uh, the uh, the salt in some wells. Uh, but away, but once it is uh, it is covered and it is secured and we reach to the carbonate it goes fine and uh, the subsequent wells is estimated even for Zor 1 the, the estimated cost was about 60 million which is not that big some wells that was drilled by British Petroleum in, 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 uh, in Nile Delta exceeds 350 million dollars okay without okay. But uh, for Zohar, it's, it's, it's not that, uh, that, uh, that difficult to drill in it. And actually, um, the Saibim Tinke uh, did an amazing job. And they had a good learning curve from drilling there. Uh, but yeah, I think it's, uh, it was much easier than drilling in thick shale in, uh, in, in Nile Delta Basin. OK. Um, Christelle asks you, uh, uh, can you tell us how many wells were drilled before a commercial discovery was announced? Uh, only one. <laughs> only one, the first one. Yeah, after so, the yeah, this one. Is, yeah, this is maybe related to the, our like uh, Lebanon's case in block four, for example, that we all know that the probability of finding is one over four or uh, like 22% to 25%, the possibility of finding like uh, from the first time. So this mm -hmm. is maybe uh, related to this, but yeah, you were uh, very lucky to find it from the first, uh, from the first time. Um, yeah, no, I, 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 it's, 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 by the way, yeah, if we consider about drilling in Egypt, it's, it's not the first one we have thousands of wells in yeah. that was drilled in Egypt yani. so uh, but yani, it's a, um, I do believe it's a gift from Allah at, at that time yani. um, Hisham Salama asks you are Zuhr and Levantine basins constructed at the same time and what uh, why the companies uh, do not want to drill deep to explore the condensate like they this, uh, did in the Nile Delta area Yani, to condensate where? Yani, uh, uh, I'm, 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 I don't know. Maybe yani, because, uh, because in the slide where you have mentioned in the northern delta area where you have found like uh, major condensate uh, findings there. So maybe he's trying to link between this and the Levantine Basin and it's what's contracted at the same time or in different geological uh, areas. Well, well, no, no, it's, 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 it's related, yeah. it's related to, the, to the type of source because in, in, in Miocene, in my scene, you can get dry gas and you can get wet gas, even in, 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 in Egypt, okay? And even in Pliocene, in Pliocene, the majority are dry gas, but in, in, in some few cases, we even produce oil from the Pliocene. So it's a matter related to the um, uh, migration pathway, not to the reservoir itself. Mm -hmm. I see. Um... And from uh, Ruwa Dandashi, uh, uh, can you please talk about the environmental risks at Zuhur and 
if you had like done or completed, uh, of course, the companies might have completed the environmental risk assessment there in the, in the before uh, drilling. So can you give some insights about the environmental risks that are, uh, uh, that come within the drilling activities in Zohar? Uh, well, uh, this is uh, this is anyway this is the requirements from uh, from the Egyptian authority is to protect the environment to the maximum. So uh, the drilling rigs are not allowed to uh, to to, to uh, let's for example for the drilling cutting to be uh, to, to be thrown to the sea or whatever it is. So there is a complete assessment. I'm I'm, I'm sorry, I'm not sure about. Uh, the, uh, the details of it, but this is the requirements and it has to be approved before start any drilling while uh, onshore or uh, offshore. Uh, protecting environment is uh, a priority uh, in the oil and gas Egyptian sector. All right, uh, Yorgo asks you, uh, um, did, uh, so did Egypt in the previous like activities or drilling uh, activities develop any well where the proven uh, reserves uh, were below one trillion cubic feet? And if yes, when was th that? Like, did you encounter any finding or uh, uh, did any company develop a finding or a proven reserve below one trillion cubic feet? Yes, yes, there is a lot. There is a lot and it's, it's a matter of, of commercial. Whenever you have discovery and you'd like to develop- Commerciality, oh, yeah. So it means, it means it, it, we have developed less than one TCF, sometimes half TCF, but it depends where this discovery is, is located. The water depths and the distance from the shore and the distance from facilities, okay? So yeah, maybe to make it more clear that we have been hearing like to, to do to do the if you want the link between what what we are hearing now currently in Lebanon and the, the question maybe the, I'm trying to uh, emphasize on maybe or try to analyze what what Yorgo was trying to say so but you have been hearing recently uh, that uh, in the block four first 12 or in the Biblos one well the the, uh, as you have mentioned, yes, uh, there is a petroleum system, which we might uh, we have been hearing about like uh, for the past years. The petroleum mm -hmm. system is there, but the, 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 there's no, there was no commercial, if you want, quantities or the quantities okay. that were found by the consortium were less than one TCF okay. or around 0 0.7. And that's why maybe the question comes that... Uh, okay. If, uh, yani, would it be because of the price currently? Those are not commercially, if you want, uh, viable. Or uh, did you encounter like such situations where findings below one TCF are uh, can be discovered uh, easily? I, I, I'll tell you something. Uh, there is something about the strategy how to develop a, a, a discovery well, before. All the operator used to make a platform if the water depth is uh, is less than 200 meters and then uh, extend pipeline to the shore where there is a facilities and then to the market. Okay, N nowadays they start to develop a floating LNG and even if you'd like to export the gas. To export the gas in Egypt, we have two LNG, one in Damita and the one in Etco. In to liquefy the gas and then to export it. This is very expensive and it needs a lot of time and money uh, to be built. But currently, they develop two different uh, approaches to evacuate the gas. First, there is a floating LNG where a, a big floating shop is uh, is located in the just beside the well in the sea and then start the well start the production and then goes to the ship for liquefaction and then to to be exported this is one now they start to develop another cheaper technique is the, the compressed gas and to, to compress gas you need just a compressor and then to compress that and then start to evacuate the gas so uh, it, it depends it, it, it depends uh, about the market and the, the technology, the applied technology, uh, and which approach you, you can choose. So, uh, from my point of view, um, when I was in EGAS, some operator came with proposed a, a, a prospect, and we are going to drill, but 
the expected reserve is not that high, so to be developed. And he was talking about developed in the conventional way to extend pipelines to the shore and facilities mm. and so on. So mm. I told him uh, that for the time being, we don't need gas in, in, in the domestic market. You can go to either approaches, uh, floating LNG or compressed gas. And you can ev evacuate it to the nearest market if you have a market. All right. I will take two more, two to three more questions because of the time constraint. But yeah, Marwan, Marwan Abdullah asks you, uh, what information do we have about the Lebanon basin and what similarities there is with other sections in the Levantine basin? Uh, well, yani, to be honest, I'm, I'm not well familiar with the, um, with the geology of Levantine and uh, Lebanon basin. But as, you, uh, as we have seen the geological survey in one map, consider Levantine Basin and Lebanon Basin as one basin. Mm -hmm. And as far as I know, it, it's, it's, uh, the Miocene is the main target because there is a huge thickness of uh, Miocene. And by the way, uh, most workers uh, are believing that this sandstone is derived from uh, Egypt, from Northern Sinai to Levantine Basin and Lebanon Basin. But the point is to find and to locate the good structure where you can get a trap uh, and the gas uh, can be accumulated within this, within this trap. Mm -hmm. um, Abdel Hadi asks you, what is the estimated lifetime of the field, of the Zohar field, and the ultimate recovery out of it? Uh, so the, the lifetime, mainly about the estimated lifetime. The, 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 lifetime, the lifetime for the, um, for the, uh, for the initial uh, proposed production, 2.7 uh, billion, uh, million, Per day, the plateau uh, should sustain for 20 years, and then uh, production start to decline. But the full lifetime is about 40 years. Okay. But the get the plateau of constant production for 20 years, which has been reached, like reached, started 2019, right? The 2.7 uh, yes, billion. Yes. So. Yes, yes, and it, it can be increased, but we actually we are not in, in need for such gas in, for the time sure. being in Egypt. Sure. Uh, Huda asks you, what about the future of gas market in Egypt as prices and are currently down, and uh, how will this impact the future plans of connecting and exporting Egyptian gas to Europe as development in Cyprus are postponed due to the market conditions? Okay. Uh, so it's more about the Egyptian market, if you want, and your uh, perspective to the current prices. Uh, yes, first for, for the for the for the domestic, uh, domestic market, uh, we used to send most of the gas production to the power stations. Okay, uh, but now with the state have started a, an ambitious plan uh, to have a good energy mix. And we have a good, now we have Bimban uh, power, uh, solar. solar park in Aswan. And it, it started already to provide the grid with electricity. And uh, we have a, an excellent wind potential in Gulf of Suez. And currently it is uh, being developed uh, with a lot of wind farms. Uh, so with time we are reducing our needs for the gas. But the... Um, least value for the gas is to burn it in the power station. You can get a better added value from the gas if you direct it to petrochemicals. Uh, if you, there is some other uh, industries that use the gas as a raw material. And currently, we are uh, trying to push towards this to use more gas in the petrochemicals and in, as a raw material uh, in the other industry like the uh, phosphate as well. And for the, for the uh, exporting market and Europe, the Commissioner of Energy and the Climate was in Egypt during 19, uh, 2018, and he said clearly, in Europe, we need the East Mediterranean gas, because currently we cannot <clears throat> get more gas from Russia, because nearly uh, they... Uh, the uh, Russia supplied uh, about 30% of the Europe gas, and it is a political and uh, security issue not to increase uh, this percentage. 
So the potential market to provide uh, Europe with gas is the East Mediterranean. And this is a, a long, uh, long plan and long strategy for Europe uh, to, uh, to get the gas from uh, East uh, Mediterranean. Mm -hmm. Uh, like one last technical question before uh, giving the floor also to Dr. Karim. But Dr. Karim asks you, what about the static and dynamic modeling of Zuhar Carbonate Reservoir? And do we have a model of, for it? And if not, can we have it? The dynamic modeling of Zuhar Carbonate Reservoir. Of course, there is a, there is a static and dynamic uh, modeling of uh, mm. Zuhar that was developed uh, uh, in any and in, in Petro during the uh, drilling the wells and adding new wells from the very beginning they start the simulation and uh, with added uh, added wells they added additional data to the simulator to monitor how the reservoir uh, dynamics is working All right. and uh, by observing this uh, uh, they had the potential to, in some in, in, in some times, uh, more than a year ago or more, to increase the productivity of some wells. All right. Okay, so so one, uh, one just last question, and before, like, uh, the, this is a more, in, in, if you want, geo uh, on, the, on the East Med geopolitics of it. So how do you look from an Egyptian perspective to the latest talk about the pipeline, the East Mediterranean gas pipeline and the formation of the EMGF, the East Mediterranean Gas Forum, among the seven countries? So from your perspective and from the Egyptian perspective, how do you look to the viability and commerciality of this pipeline that will be able to move, as you have said, uh, the gas to the European markets? You mean that law is that one that extends over Israel, Cyprus, and yes. Greece, and Europe? Yes, okay. Europe to it, Italy through Greece. Well, it's, it, it's, it's not a new idea at all. It's an old idea. But it, okay. yeah, could, is it feasible today in the low oil, like low gas oil prices uh, era? <coughs> and uh, it's, it's around 7 billion like of investment. Uh, I know. It's, uh, it's, yeah. Let me say, it's not the matter of, uh, it's not the matter of the, uh, uh, the ability and the low uh, gas price for the time being, but it's a matter of is it physically can be constructed or not? You know, it, it crosses the, uh, the area where the water depth exceeds three kilometers. This is one. The other one, you know, recently, uh, a week ago, there was an earthquake in Crete, Crete island and it happened from time to time because this boundary that goes around Crete, uh, Crete uh, island is the boundary between the African plate and the European plate and the African plate is going below the European plate so this is a potential uh, a potential line for earthquakes and from the satellite it is well observed that Africa is moving towards Europe at nearly three centimeters every year, which is uh, uh, so the, with time, the Mediterranean, with logical time, I mean, and not in the near future, uh, the uh, Mediterranean will be closed again. So having this line at a potential, a, 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 a potential a potentially seismic prone and earthquake brown area, is it visible or not? I think it's, it's a very big risk to move in such area and use steel pipes and it is rigid and with such earthquakes, uh, this earthquakes reached uh, Egypt, reached uh, uh, Alexandria and so on and it was 5.6 on Richter scale. So this is the main this is the main issue, and it was recognized by Wood Mackenzie, and it was presented in one of the mock conferences in Alexandria uh, four years ago. This earth, uh, this uh, seismic prone area. This is the main uh, the main issue of this line. 
Thank you. Thank you so much, Dr. Ahmed. I give the floor to Karim to say a few last words uh, before ending this uh, webinar. So uh, you have a last word, Karim, to Dr. Ahmed. Okay, Mark. Thank you, thank you again. Uh, Dr. Ahmed, uh, thanks, Dr. Erlen, for your uh, effort and your time. Uh, Dr. Ahmed, a, a very well, uh, well known in the oil and gas industry. Uh, I want to show my appreciation for your time, for giving us a portion of your valuable time. And we hope we can uh, go along the same session in the future, inshallah. Thank you.